experience, your life. and she's there. <laughs> and Ron <laughs> Pattinson's camera is working at the moment, and that's not a Ron problem. That is a technology problem. So thank you, Ron, for hanging in there. It's getting late on your end of the world. Uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't have any work to do or anything anymore, so what the hell, you know? <laughs> I, I, I'm I, I'm a, a happily unemployed person, so you know. Well, I hope you'll continue in the chat uh, when we're there. Yeah. Will you? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, right, I'm, I'm going to be. And no problem. Excellent. So I'm going to turn off your camera and Mike. You and Gabe will catch up with you guys in just a little bit. Maybe when we get to the Q and A. Is that good? Sounds good. All right. Mitch, as I get everything switched over here. There we go. All right. Should Excellent. I share my and screen. And hopefully the audience will let us know if everybody is hearing and seeing okay. And if everybody can see your presentation, I see it clearly. And that looks very similar to Ron's last slide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know where I got this this uh, drawing. I, I, apparently, I got it from Ron, but um, I just have this file of of photographs and old British drawings and English brewery drawings, and I just throw them into the presentation. So, Ron, forgive me for for nicking your your art. Uh, <laughs> no, that's perfect collaboration. I mean, that just dovetailed right in, just like Mike's delicious beers. Uh, this is amazingly uh, going smoothly. Well, all right, Mitch, I can't wait to hear your presentation. So please take it away. All right. I, and I will be quick. I'll gloss over some of the stuff that I have in here that was delved into at length with, with Vinny. But um, let's see. So, you know, I, you know, like Ron said, there's a lot of different variations of IPA and, and I, you know, I've kind of categorized them into separate, separate uh, time buckets. And what I'm going to focus on mostly is, is the craft IPA revolution and, and how that all came about and what some of the key elements were of that. Um, I did want to mention that in the 1800s, there were a lot of American breweries brewing IPAs. And, and that's something that's not widely known. And it was one of the things that really fascinated me when I, when I did the research for, for my book on IPA. This is a, a, a drawing of, of one of the breweries. This is the Frank Jones Brewery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which was at, at the time was one of the largest ale breweries in the United States. And they did a lot of IPAs. And if you ever go to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, Two of the buildings in that picture, the one on the far left and the one on the far right, are still there, uh, and uh, they're being used for other businesses right now. But it's it's pretty cool to see. Um, and then in New Jersey, in Newark, uh, Fegan Span uh, did a lot of IPA as well. Uh, and this this picture is of their um, their vats, you know, and, and, and the big thing about American IPAs at the time is they didn't use the barrels or the hogsheads to age their IPAs. They typically used larger tanks or vats or fooders, whatever you want to call them. Um, and, and then here's a shot. This is an advertisement uh, from 1897, the C.H. Evans and Sons India Pale Ale. And a couple things I wanted to point out here. Um, Number one, it, it, this comment in the middle that says it does not contain a particle of sediment, dregs, or yeast cells. That was very important for a lot of IPA brewers back in the day, that the beer was crystal clear. And, and they made a big deal about it at, at C.H. Evans. Uh, when I was researching the book, uh, one of the ancestors uh, uh, of, of the family that owned this brewery had opened up a brew pub in Albany, New York, uh, called C.H. Evans. And, and he was really cool and gave us a great interview. And that's where I got this picture from. But the 1900s were tough for, for India Pale Ales and strong beers, as we've talked about at length. Uh, a lot of things going on in the United States in particular. The consolidation that happened after Prohibition and the rise of the American lager breweries really just about killed everybody uh, that was doing ales in the United States. And 
Um, you know, and it really didn't, there was a couple of exceptions, but really IPA was pretty much gone from the, uh, from the portfolio of American breweries. One of the exceptions, of course, was Ballantyne. And this uh, was a very unique beer. I think Michael Jackson, the beer writer, mentioned that he thought this was like one of the last true holdouts of the 1800s IPAs. And I'm not sure I agree with that. I think it's a little bit different, but, um, you know, there's some really cool things about it. Uh, number one, uh, Ballantine's IPA was aged in wood for a complete year. Uh, and most of the brewers of IPAs in the United States really, really looked at the British brewing techniques and tried to adopt them. And this is this is one of those cases. Um, as smooth and mellow as old wine, um, you know, it, it, it's a stock ale. It's aged for a long time. It's strong. And then the big thing about uh, Ballantine, which is, was mentioned in the chats, uh, was the use of a distilled hop oil from bullion hops. And bullion hops are just about all gone. I don't know if there's any significant acreage being grown. The last I heard, there might have been an acre somewhere here or there in Yakima. Uh, but Ballantine's IPA in its heyday featured the bullion hop and probably used cluster as well. And they did some sort of hops distillation process. And when I started digging into this and I started talking to people that had worked at, worked at Pabst back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and Pabst was the brewery that ended up buying uh, Ballantyne. I think Falstaff bought Ballantyne first and then Pabst bought Falstaff. But Mitch, somehow we've lost your screen share. Can you pop it back in there right quick? Absolutely. Thank you. How's that? Hope, hopefully everybody can see the screen now. We're good. It looks okay. great. All right, Doug. Thank you. Um, so anyway, Ballantine IPA was one of those beers that, that kind of hung on until the late 1960s. And it, it, it was a very important beer for the development of craft IPA because both uh, Fritz Maytag and, um, and Ken Grossman were inspired by Ballantine IPA and, and wanted to brew something that had that kind of hop character. And we talked about Liberty Ale a little bit. Um, and we talked about Celebration Ale and, um, you know, and then, and then Vinny brought up Grant's IPA and Rubicon IPA, which, you know, are, are to me kind of the, the origins of what we think of today as craft brewed IPA. Um, and of course, you know, we, we've got a lot of brewers that do a really good job with IPA uh, right now. You know, this, this would be the West Coast IPA thing. This is a, a, a table that I put together for my book. Um, I, I need to update it, but basically what I tried to do was give a snapshot of how, how uh, a lot of these historical and current beers were brewed. Uh, what was typical as far as ingredients and such. And so if you have my book, you've, you've got this table. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, a couple of things I'll point out, you know, down at the bottom, it says multiple dry hops and, you know, historical IPA was, was Mitch, multiple. Mitch, can you zoom in at all? It's a bit of an eye chart. Uh, I don't know if I can, Doug. Um, I'm not sure how I would do that. Okay. Because I'm in it. I'm in presentation mode. Anyway, I'll move on because this has got a lot of information and it's a bit hard to read, uh, and I understand that. Um, but you know, I this so this talk I I wanted to talk about some of the variations of IPA that came along after some of those original IPAs were brewed, uh, and of course the double uh, IPA is is one of them. Um, and and this was the beer that that Vinny talked about a lot with his inauguration ale uh, in the 1990s. Uh, it really took off as a style in the early 2000s. I think it was 2003 when they first had the category in the Great American Beer Festival. Um, and we talked about how higher alcohol results in higher perceived sweetness in in the beer, and that's a good reason to avoid using a lot of crystal malts in a double IPA and enhancing the dryness with your mashing profile. 
And then we talked about triple IPA with Vinny. Um, you know, there's there's not a uh, a clear definition of what this style is, but I think you know, as I've talked to a lot of brewers who make these beers, and as I've made them uh, myself, um, you know, the things that they have in common are 100 IBUs plus in the wort, uh, greater than 10% alcohol, uh, just massive hop character. And, um, you know, I list a, a, a few of the great examples of triple IPAs out there, um, you know, including a couple of my own, which I really like, uh, not to toot my own horn, but, you know, Heretic Evil 3 is a very special beer for me. And, um, uh, you know, we do a beer called Radagast IPA every year that's a triple IPA. Uh, the quadruple IPA is one that has kind of gotten a couple of false starts. I, I remember having one that was brewed by a brewery called Rip Current in, in San Diego County. And Paul Sangster, who's, uh, you know, a multiple award-winning home brewer who started Rip Current, uh, I talked with him about that beer, uh, his quadruple IPA, and he said it was a really fun beer, but they'd never do it again. Um, you know, that was one of those ones where the efficiencies really took a dive. Um, a lot of IPA substyles have come and gone, and I'm just going to talk real briefly about them. Uh, Belgian IPA, uh, there's, there's two ways that brewers did Belgian IPAs. Number one was to brew something Belgian and hop the hell out of it. Uh, using American hops. And, and then the other method was to brew a typical West Coast IPA and ferment it with Belgian yeast. And when I was at Stone, we did both. Uh, Cali Belgique IPA was, was the second method. And the vertical epic, I think from 2009, I think it was, was the prior version, you know, the, the brewing a Belgian beer. Uh, as a base and then hopping it like an IPA. And we were definitely inspired by a beer called Duval Green Hop, which was uh, a wonderful, um, wonderful Belgian hoppy beer. But both both versions of this use a Belgian yeast strain and use IPA friendly hop varieties. Um, Wit IPA, this was one that I put into my book at the very last minute because it looked like it was going to do something and it really didn't. Uh, but Crux Fermentation Project, Larry Sador and, and Stephen Pawels at, at Boulevard brewed the first one that I was aware of. And then I got to brew one with John Harris out at Ecliptic in Oregon at one point. But again, you know, there's two ways to approach brewing this. One is to brew an IPA and ferment it with ye wit yeast and add coriander and orange peel or brew a wit and hop the crap out of it. And they both work. Okay, black IPA. I can see some, uh, some conversations going on in the chat about black IPA. Um, you know, and, and the Export India Porter or East India Porter definitely was something that I took a lot of interest in when I was researching my book. And uh, I, I talked with Garrett Oliver from Brooklyn Brewery who had gone over to J.W. Lee's and brewed a beer called Manchester Star that was an East India Porter. And, and when I was researching the book on IPA, uh, Steve Wagner and I went to England a couple of times and did a lot of research. And one of the trips, we stopped by the J.W. Lee's Brewery and, and talked to them about this beer. Um, but Black IPA, is, is, it's an interesting one because, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of confusion about where this style kind of came into being. And, and moving along from the East India Porter idea, really the first dark American IPAs that I was able to find were brewed in Vermont at uh, the Vermont Pub and Brewery, which is in Burlington, Vermont. And it's a wonderful spot. And Greg Noonan was a legendary brewer who ran that brewery until he passed away. Um, and they, they were brewing a beer that was inspired by a beer called uh, Alimony Ale, which was brewed by Buffalo Bill's Brewery, Bill Owens in Hayward, California, and he claimed it was the bitterest beer in the world, which I thought was pretty clever and pretty fun. Uh, but they, uh, the folks at the Vermont Pub and Brewery wanted to brew a dark, really bitter beer. And, and this was the beer that inspired some of the first brewers of black IPAs, including Sean Hill, uh, who was at a, um, a brewery called The Shed in uh, Waterville, Vermont at the time. 
Um, if you're going to brew a, a black IPA, uh, my recommendation is to brew something that's very similar to a regular IPA, West Coast IPA or West Coast double IPA, and just add three to 5% dehusk black malt. And that way you don't get the dark roasted character. You get a nice dark color. You get a little bit of roast, but the hops can really come through. And to me, have, after doing a lot of test brewing uh, before we came out with the Stone 11th anniversary, uh, which became sublimely self-righteous. Uh, you know, we had been using chocolate malts and black malts and just, it, they just tasted like hoppy stouts and hoppy porters. And so we, uh, uh, we did uh, uh, some work with, with the Dehusk Carafa 3 Special from Weyermann because I, I knew that that was how a lot of brewers were making Schwartz beer in Germany, which to me was not very roasty. And so we went in that direction and, and, you know, in my opinion, we, we got the beer that we wanted. And then session IPAs, you know, kind of came and went. I think Founders All Day IPA is still out there. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to approach this. Um, you know, when I did it at Stone, we, we made, um, a, you know, a lower alcohol beer and we kept the bitterness, you know, 50 to 60 IBUs, not, not 70 like a West Coast IPA, but, you know, still substantial for a beer of that gravity. And then we dry hopped it like a double IPA. And, um, you know, that was, uh, that was one of those things that we thought it was going to be a big deal. The brewers all loved it, but people who buy beer still tend to buy based on alcohol content. And when they saw a Stone IPA at 7 Point one, and they saw go to IPA at four and a half for the same price because it cost the same to make them. Basically, um, it was uh, uh, you know they 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 uh, bought based on the alcohol content, and and the style really has struggled because of that. Um, and I see some some conversations about um, about Cascadian dark ale, and I. I, I will be honest, I always hated that reference because the beard style didn't originate in, in Oregon or Washington where the Cascade Mountains are, but I get it. Um, I think one of the things that killed Black IPA was, was the oxymoron of the name, you know? And, and we've said this a couple of times, you know, today that IPA has become more than just a specific style. It's become kind of a, just a general uh, definition of a very hoppy beer. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. I, you know, uh, uh, we didn't like the name Cascadian Dark because we didn't think it, it paid proper respect to the origins of the style. But, you know, I get why people wanted to call it that. And, uh, you know, we came out with a beer at Stone for our 15th anniversary. And, and Steve Wagner, who was really a very funny guy, he, he was the one that wanted to call it Escondidian Dark Ale. And I think that's that's what we ended up using. Um, you know, and then moving on, a lot of different different variations of the IPA style have come along. I think two of the most popular are the ones that are hopped with Australian hops and New Zealand hops. And we've talked about those hops a bit today, you know, about how they tend to last longer in the beer and they provide more tropical fruit. Uh, and tropical fruit in an IPA is where it's at right now. You know, people aren't really gravitating towards piney or citrusy. They're, they're looking for stone fruit, mango, you know, that kind of thing in IPAs by and large, at least in my neck of the woods. Um, a bit about hazy IPA, and I, I don't want to beat on this too much, but you know, there are some things that I think make this beer very interesting. Um, you know, and, and if you're brewing a, a hazy IPA, you've got to use some, some wheat or some oats or both uh, in the grist. Um, you know, the hopping, um, you know, citrusy, stone fruit, you know, again, the tropical fruit thing is very important. Dank is okay. Grassy hops are not. Uh, so you wouldn't want to use like German hops in, 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 a, in a hazy IPA. Dry hopping during the fermentation, multiple dry hops. There's some brewers like, like Monkish out in the, um, uh, out on the West Coast that just, they're not doing a mid-fermentation dry hop. They're just overloading the beer with hops. It, uh, at the end of fermentation, you know, over five to six pounds per barrel. And I think that's where you start getting into hop burn territory. 
Um, I see in the chat, German hops. Yeah, it, you know, German IPA. I, you know, I put that in there because we did one in Stone uh, called Gutter Damerang. I think it was was the name, but um, you know, it was it was an IPA brewed with Pilsner malt, ale yeast, and all German hops, and it was a lot of fun to brew. Um, and there are some historical examples of of those, um, and and current examples as well. Um, Hay stability, we talked about that in our discussion with Vinny about how hard that is to achieve. And, and Vinny actually, you know, reached out to me and was wanted to ask me some questions about how we were doing it. And I know he talked to Sierra Nevada as well. Um, but uh, brewing a, a New England IPA using the high protein grains at 30 to 40 percent uh, gives a, an additional aspect of fullness or softness uh, to the palate. Um, some brewers are using a lot of crystal, some brewers are using lactose, and I, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into that, especially since Mike doesn't want me to. Um, but uh, water chemistry is super important. Um, you know, a, a two or three to one chloride to sulfite ratio really reduces the impact of the bitterness of the hops and makes the beer much softer. And that's a real critical part for brewing a good, a good hazy IPA, in my opinion. Um, you know, the the West Coast IPA is the exact opposite. You know, there's a lot of sulfate, a lot of calcium in those beers. And, and uh, with the hazy IPA, you're, you're taking that down several notches. Um, we talked about uh, um, cool pool hopping, um, you know, doing the hopping in the whirlpool after the word has chilled a bit. Uh, some brewers I've I know are... Are brewing in high gravity and adding cold wort uh, or cold liquor, cold water to the to the brew as it gets transferred into the whirlpool, and that way you get you get the reduction in in temperature, and you can get those hops in there and capture a lot of the volatiles and not get any as isomerization, and the bitterness level of New England IPA is uh, significantly lower than a West Coast IPA. Um, yeast is very important. Uh, the yeast strains really play a part in the biotransformation with the mid-fermentation dry hop. Uh, we've tried a lot of different yeasts. Most, most brewers have settled on London Ale 3 as kind of the standard. Um, and then if you're adding the right hop varieties early in the fermentation, there are enzymes in the yeast that act on the oils, the terpenes, the, the sulfur compounds in the hops and, and create different flavors most of which is demonstrated with a lot of orange juice character. Um, and then, you know, doing a second dry hop. Uh, there are some brewers that don't do a mid-fermentation dry hop at all and make very well-regarded hazy IPAs. But uh, I think most people do a fermentation dry hop and then a post-fermentation dry hop. So some of the key differences between hazy IPA and West Coast IPA is, is the 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 malt bill, the grain bill, um, that is, you know, a, a West Coast IPA would be mostly two row malt and a little bit of crystal. And, you know, a, a hazy IPA has the oats and wheat in it. Uh, we talked about the chloride to sulfite, sulfate ratio in the water, uh, lower IBUs, higher terminal gravity. Uh, this adds to the softness and to the sweetness of the beer. Um, getting the biotransformation dry hop addition and, and using higher hop addition rates in general. Here's some examples. I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of these. So uh, anyway, that's that's my, my talk on hazy IPA. Um, brewed IPA is another one that kind of came and went. Um, and, you know, I thought this one might have a little bit of staying power, but really, you, what we heard from our distributors and what we heard from from beer drinkers is they really didn't like the word brute. Uh, you know, they associated it with with aftershave and not with an extra dry beer like an extra dry champagne. So, um, you know, the brute terminology didn't work. Um, this was created by a brewer out in San Francisco. Uh, his name is Kim Sturdivant. Uh, and he was at the time at the Social Kitchen and Brewery. And so these notes on how this beer was brewed came from interviews that he had done talking about the style. Uh, using some adjunct, 
using a low temperature mash. The big thing with a Brute IPA uh, at the time was using European hops or uh, hops that had more of a fruity character, uh, but not citrusy. And then also the addition of amyloglucosidase enzyme, which is added in the brew house mash or late in the fermentation. And what that enzyme does is it breaks down the residual sugars and dextrins that are in the wort or in the mash and breaks them down into glucose, which is very easily fermented by yeast. And so these non-fermentable sugars are transformed into fermentable sugars. And that's how you get a beer that is so dry. And this is the technique that's used in, in several light beers. Uh, you know, Michelob Ultra, it definitely uses amyloglucosidase, uh, you know, and, and taking that, that technique from the large brewers and, and putting it into a craft beer, I think is, is pretty interesting and pretty, pretty groundbreaking. Um, here's some brewed IPAs. I've got the Social Kitchen brewed IPA. Drake's Brewing out in San Leandro in the Bay Area of California is, was, has done a lot of different brute IPAs. They really embraced it. Um, you know, some of the beers on the bottom, the, the fretboard uh, out of Cincinnati, the Bootsy IPA, which was done in conjunction with Bootsy Collins, a really great beer. And they don't tell anybody it's a brute IPA, but it is. They told me. Um, Sierra Nevada did a brute IPA and, and kind of a new way, new approach um, for brute IPA is, is what we we did, and Oscar Blues did one as well, you know, a low calorie hazy IPA. Um, and we use the, the enzyme, we make the beer with a low starting gravity and we're able to make a beer that's, you know, 4% alcohol, but less than a hundred calories per, per 12 ounces and less than five grams of carbs. And, um, and, and we thought this might be a way to keep the Brute IPA uh, concept alive and make it a little more attractive to certain beer drinkers. So anyway, it's, uh, we rolled out with this one last year and it's, it's, um, we put it in package this year and it's, it's done reasonably well for us. Um, so yeah, uh, next one is, is kind of a new one, cold IPA. And, and a lot of people say this is just, a um, uh, India pale lager, but it's a little bit different. Um, this was uh, a style created by uh, Wayfinder Brewery in Oregon. And, uh, you know, the base beer is an American or a Mexican lager with adjuncts and fermented with a lager yeast. You want to use a clean strain, maybe not 3470 or the Vine Stefan strain, but maybe, you know, like uh, high pressure lager yeast or Mexican lager yeast or something like that that provides a little bit less sulfur dioxide uh, during the fermentation. And then um, dry hop this with newer hop varieties towards the end of fermentation. You still get a little bit of biotransformation. You reduce some oxygen content. And you end up with a beer that's, you know, 6 to 7% alcohol. It's very hoppy, but it's a lager. It's not an ale, and it's very dry. And here are some, uh, here are some uh, cold IPAs that are out there. Um, uh, Wayfinder, of course, was the originator of it. Uh, Ecliptic and Wayfinder recently did a collaboration uh, on a cold IPA. Uh, we did a collaboration with Sean O'Sullivan at 21st Amendment. Um, gosh, it was almost two years ago now we did this beer. And Sean was really intrigued by what Wayfinder was doing. And we decided we wanted to try it. And we used flaked rice as our adjunct and cashmere hops in it. And it was it was a nice beer. I liked it a lot. So other IPA subsets, you'll see there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, Dick Cantwell came out with a book called Eclectic IPA that covers a lot of this. I think to Mike's point, you know, the whole idea of using terpenes and using uh, hemp-based terpenes and using terpenes derived from hops and beers that are supposed to taste like marijuana, I think that is something that is coming. Um, you know, there's a brewery here in Atlanta where I live, uh, Sweetwater, that has done a lot of this work. They've done a lot of beers that use her, uh, terpenes that are similar to cannabis terpenes and, and have come up with some really interesting beers. Um, so I think that's, that's, I agree with Mike that that is something that is going to be happening more and more in the future. And I think, um, honestly, as IPAs continue to move forward, 
I think it will continue to evolve and it's not going to go away. There's no sign of fatigue, although some of the subsets, some of the you know offshoots of IPA have come and gone very quickly. Uh, but Hazy IPA has been the number one growth IPA in the category for several years now. And um, I, think, I think new hop varieties uh, are going to drive a lot of the IPA um, uh, IPA development as it moves forward. And then also the research into biotransformation, the impact of terpenes, um, sulfur compounds, thiols, things like that in, in the in hops and in hemp, uh, for example, are going to uh, going to play a role. And uh, Chris just mentioned Keith Via's book on THC and CBD, which I haven't bought yet. I need to uh, uh, I need to buy that book because we're certainly very interested. Um, uh, and and the question here on the chat: How does a cold IPA differ from an India Pale Lager? I think it's it's based on strength. India Pale Lager is more like an IPA fermented with a lager yeast, and and the cold IPA is more of a uh, a lager that is dry hopped. And and that would be my my take on it. Of course, you know all these things are still in development. So that really wraps up what I was going to talk about. And I tried to be quick because I covered a lot of this in my discussion with Vinny. But I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And we can take some questions, I guess. Yeah, we've got a couple. But I thought before we switch to them, I would love everybody's input. I'll switch full screen. But I thought this was quite a lineup of beers. Uh, might be the most complete history of... IPA certainly that I have ever seen and just uh, switching to kind of let everybody know so that is what the 1840 looks like and then the 1902 is there in the center sorry that's not more smooth I don't have a so super sophisticated system the uh, 1918 is that one. And this one gets a little bit darker. That is the 1948. That is the 1974. And then our last one, a little bit off screen there, is the 1994. So... Again, that's kind of the lineup of Mike's Delicious Beers, uh, which really added so much to this discussion. <laughs> it was phenomenal. All right, so let's go to our questions. We got a couple there. Vote them up, and then we will wrap this guy up. Uh, so our most popular question right now comes from Tim. Tim says, impossible question. But can you explain why the American palate changed so much to accept highly hopped beers after decades of adjunct lagers? Yeah, I can I can talk to that. I, th I think it has a lot to do with what was going on in food and, and other beverages at the time. You know, there was a, um, a definite shift in the 1980s tor towards uh, bolder flavors in everything, it, be it bread, be it cheese, be it coffee. And I think uh, beer just followed along. And uh, I think the fact that that brewers at the time were able to brew what they want and then talk to people about why it was special and educate people was a very important component of that. But I think it was just, you know, this general shift, I think we saw in the 80s and 90s towards more robust flavors in, in everything and kind of a rejection of, you know, uh, it, which happens all the time. You know, the new generation comes along and rejects certain things, certain elements of the generation prior. And certainly if you look at the 1960s and 1970s, that was American bread or, or white bread, American cheese, um, you know, Folgers coffee. And, you know, I think people as they matured, uh, you know, grew up with that and then they matured and wanted to uh, kind of set their own path. I think that's, this was a consequence of that. Well, it's, it's like it's discussed in a lot of beers. Complexity adds interest. Yeah. So while consistency may be fantastic for an industrial style beer, 
more complexity adds a lot of fascination and interest that keeps you from just drinking, but actually enjoying what you're drinking. Great question, Great. Tim. Steve, ask the next question. How is cold IPA different than IPL? And I know you touched on that. Yeah, I think um, it, it's still kind of gray because there aren't any set defined styles. And I'm not a big beer styles guy to begin with. But to me, um, you know, when I've talked to my friends who are brewers and they've done India Pale Lagers, and I, I've done a couple of them. One of them was a collaboration with with uh, fat heads, we approached it like an IPA, but we used a, we used a lager yeast to ferment it. And, and a cold IPA is more slanted towards um, a malt liquor, basically. It's a, it's a strong American lager, but it's, it's hopped like an IPA. And so you get different flavor profiles from them. An India Pale Lager to me is more like an India Pale Ale. And um, uh, the, uh, the cold IPA is more like a really hoppy lager, American lager style. So what I would say is, what, what do you think of um, malt liquor as a style? <laughs> yeah, that's a loaded question, isn't it? I, I, I think the name is kind of kind of silly. Um, I, you know, certainly the, there was a market for many years for high alcohol American lagers that people enjoyed. Uh, you know, I, when I was a, a youngin drinking, just getting into beer, you know, you got a lot of bang for your buck off of Mickey's malt liquor or Schlitz malt liquor. And so that's what made it attractive. Well, well, I say this because uh, Mike Karnofsky, he did this one thing when we, when we had this one um, event at his place where he was comparing. Um, oh, he's there, Mike. <laughs> oh, 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 old English to this one um, Whitbread 19th century beer. <laughs> and, and, and they were incredibly similar, weren't they, Mike? <laughs> Mike, your mic's not on. Mike, your mic's not on. Mike, Mike. <laughs> no sound, Mike. <laughs> uh, I can't turn it on, Mike. Sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 your your mics are uh, anyway. I, I, I mean, we had this really interesting thing where we compared uh, old, old English to uh, this uh, uh, late nineteenth century um, Whitbread Mild Ale, uh, and they were in, in, remarkably similar. Um, oh, no. Mike had put in the chat that subtle flavors are really kind of lost on people now and i'll have to say as a youngster i did consume plenty of schlitz malt liquor bull <laughs> which which i can't stand anymore but at the time it seemed great so i think there's a time for everything i mean i and and as uh, business people we've got to kind of react with those and and yeah, well, well, sell well, what I've, people uh, are willing to buy the older i've got the less snobby I've got about beer, I must say. And yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of different types of beer and there's lots of different types of beer that people enjoy. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, if someone likes a certain type of beer, well, who am I to tell them that they're an idiot? You, you know? <laughs> um, you, you know, I... I one of the beers I drink a lot of nowadays is is Kupina um, Gladiator, which is just this, you know, this strong lager, which is not a particularly wonderful, classy beer or anything, but I actually quite like it. And and, and you know, I, I used to I used to be incredibly snobby about beer and think, oh, you know, you you're just drinking rubbish, you people. And, and I've realized, well, well, no, I mean, there, there, there's, there's loads of ways to appreciate beer. And who am I to tell anyone that, that just because they drink something that's a cheap beer that it's rubbish? Well, no, it's not necessarily rubbish. 
if you like it and you enjoy it, then it isn't rubbish. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm completely betraying all my my camera <laughs> camera uh, <laughs> original camera identity. Well, you know, it was like yes, keg beer is evil. Um, and yeah, I've, 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 you know, one of the things I, I, I was working with someone, and, and 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 he took me out somewhere, and we we had a beer, and he gave me a a Miller Light, and I drank it, and I thought, well, that's actually not that bad a beer. It it, it wasn't actually rubbish. I've actually had way worse beers than that, and. It made me really think about it. something. It's like, yeah, you know, you know, it's something like Budweiser. Budweiser isn't a terrible beer. It's a beer that lots of people like. And so if lots of people like it, it can't be that bad, can it? Well, um, while, while we're while we're talking about tastes, I think Rodney has a good question that's kind of interesting because... Kavike and and we've got an actually an upcoming live stream uh, with Lars Garshol, and Kavike seems to be having a lot of momentum. So Rodney asks, you know, have you worked much with Kavike with yeast or Kavike yeast with IPAs? So what do you think of Kavike and IPAs? Uh, I like them. I I've we've had a lot of fun with that yeast. Uh, several different strains. We've uh, We've kind of settled on the Harnendal strain for our hoppy beers. We've done some uh, some hazy style IPAs with it, and, and the nice thing about it is is that yeast tends to produce a lot of pineapple character, which really works well in in a hazy and, and tropical type flavor profile. So um, <clears throat> we've had a lot of fun with it, and the, and the nice benefit of using Kvik yeast is is that the beer stays hazy <laughs> it's one of those yeast that just hangs out and and so if you want to see make in the a, old days in, in the old days that would have been seen as a bad characteristic well, well yeah i mean that's how i was trained for sure you know it's clarity is is godliness and <laughs> so this whole thing has been kind of a, a a very very hard thing for me to deal with philosophically but you know it is what it is and this weird with the whole thing with with, with um Things like fight yeast that suddenly this really obscure Norwegian yeast has become like this hot thing. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think basically because it's very easy to work with. You don't have to worry yeah. about temperature control and loads of shit. That you know, it's 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 basically a yeast where you just throw it in there and it works. And yeah, at the end of it, you've got beer. <laughs> Pretty much. I know Charlie Papazian <laughs> told me he thought it would has the potential to revolutionize particularly small breweries because fermenters could they don't need as many fermenters as they once did with Kvike. Yeah, certainly a beer that turns over in, in ten days is a lot easier to brew than you know, a lot easier to work with in a brewery than a brewery that takes twenty one days or twenty eight days or thirty five. So, you know, you, you just gain a lot of capacity. Um, you know, by brewing I've, I've, like that. I've been looking at all these old um, Heineken brewing records recently, which have um, uh, these really detailed Heineken records that have have just been making me go completely crazy. But <laughs> they were doing the they were doing the primary fermentation in nine days. Okay, how long oh, were wow. they lagering? Do you remember? Um, two months. Okay. Yeah, when I worked at Budweiser, the primary fermentation was about five days. Oh, really? And, yeah, and then it just went straight into lagering, and and there was a lot of yeast activity happening during lagering. The, all the all the natural carbonation, the conditioning, and all that stuff happened there. So they, uh, it wasn't like a European lager profile. It was very different. But, but so, what temperature was that at? The, if they were fermenting that quickly. Uh, trying to remember it was a long time ago i think i think it was around 55 degrees fahrenheit for primary so with okay, a longer that's, yeast that's pretty warm right yeah I, I mean heineken they were doing their profile was seven degrees centigrade to 10 degrees centigrade and then down again 
Yeah, I've got completely right. obsessed. I've, I've got completely obsessed with Heineken. I've got so much detailed information about how with the way Heineken brewed it. it it's, it's, um, yeah, it, 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 well, really we interesting. Are coming up on four and a half hours that I know Mitch has been online and Ron has been online. So we're going to wrap this up at the top of the hour. I'll cover a couple of quick questions and I'm going to cherry pick the ones that are staying on the IPA subject. Um, oh so no, Heineken, the, Heineken, 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 Heineken lager. No, no, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a der derivation, but we can do that one sometime. But I like uh, DT asked the questions, any tips on how to barrel age an IPA? And since that was the first one we we tasted, and also I've had a barrel aged torpedo, which I thought was phenomenal. No, but 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 IPA should be barrel aged. The original IPAs, they were all stock ales. They they were aged for at least a year in the barrel uh, with with Britannomyces. So so if you want to have a, a proper IPA, it has to be has to be barrel aged. It's not authentic otherwise. So what's old is new. Mitch? Yeah, I, I'm not going to argue with that. I think, I think you know, if you want to brew a authentic IPA, it's got to spend some time aging in wood. And, uh, uh, you know, I I think if you're going to brew a barrel-aged IPA, and, and Mike, Mike can probably weigh on this better than I can because I think he's done more of them, but I, I think you leave the dry hopping till after the aging process and let them, let them do their thing in the wood and then come pull it out and then and then dry hop it so you get some fresh hop character out of it. Mike, I can't get your mic to turn on, but uh, we do see you there, buddy. Maybe you can put something in the chat if you want to add something to that. Well, again, I think uh, I was floored with how delicious the barrel age torpedo was. And I'm really impressed with 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 Mike's uh, barrel aged. Uh, it really adds some nice complexity. So I, I see that as a interesting style, although I know barrel aging is maybe falling out of popularity. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm in a, 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 the original IPAs, they were all barrel aged like fuck. I mean, they, 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 they were. They, <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. I, I, I said a bad word there. But they're, they're all bar they're all barrel aged for ages. I mean, I mean, you know, at least a year in the barrel before any, anything happened to it. So I mean, yeah. Um, the, 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 and, and, and anyone who doesn't have access to some of the peers have eventually persuaded to people to brew for me which were the, the, done the right way Orval, that's the closest to a, a authentic ipa in the world yeah all right we have a really interesting question here uh that uh because beer engines have been very very interested in my audience it's the most popular one for larry and larry says We'll just throw this out to everybody, and Mike, you might have to put your answer in the chat because I know you have a beer engine. Have you ever brewed an IPA for serving in a beer engine, and how would you approach serving or brewing such a beer? Well, I know, I know Mike's definitely done this, and what he did was he, he brewed a normal beer, and then he stuck it through the beer engine. And it tasted I, really I, good. And Ron, and I it, had one of those. I think he served me <clears throat> the 1943 from the beer engine. And it was phenomenal, had a beautiful head, and I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, well, Mitch, you see thoughts? some of the... Well, you see some of the beers that, that that Mike's does. He does the thing where he has the big, huge head on the top of it. It just looks so good. Um uh, yeah, he's one of my favorite brewers, by the way. That's why I, why I always end up hanging around in, uh, in, in, in Asheville, even though it's so difficult to get to bloody Asheville. I always end up hanging around there just because of that guy. <laughs> so, and the Mitch, any brewers. comments, anything unique on uh, something served through a beer engine? 
What me? Was that for me? Um, yes, you know what? I, I I don't have a heck of a lot of experience, which is uh, with with this. I uh, was looking at putting in a cask beer program at New Realm and, and realized that nobody else was interested in it but me. Um, <laughs> and and so me, uh, me as well, me as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and Ron, uh, we um, uh, we did uh, when I was at Stone, we did several batches of beer in in England uh, with Adnams and a couple of other brewers that were served on cask and they were stone style beers and they did, they did just great. And, you know, the only thing that was really different from the way we brewed our beer in the United States was, was the use of gelatin fining agents to clarify the beer. And uh, really other than that, the dry hopping was similar and, and they, they threw a little more dry hops in the cask as well. But that's, that's seemed to work. I mean, every time I got to try one of our beers, I really enjoyed it. So you thought it worked really well? I did. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, cask beer. There's, there's nothing like cask beer, is there? There really isn't. <laughs> no, <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. You know, well, personally, I, I think cask beer is better than anything else in the world. Um, you know, Cast conditioned beer, I think that is the ultimate. You know, I'm, 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 sorry, 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 Mitch. I, I mean, you, you brewed some lovely beers and you brewed some cast beers as well, but uh, personally, I think cast beer is the is the ultimate in 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 beer in the world, uh, and a good cast beer is better than anything else that that's ever been brewed. Other than the really good lager, I would say. A well, lager a good with the Ron. We'll have a discussion about that coming up at the end of August. Uh, guys, I got to thank you. You've hung in here. I know you start at one thirty. That's four and a half hours. <laughs> and Mike, you said this was going to be a phenomenal presentation and discussion, and it absolutely was. Delicious beer. Uh, content uh, I've certainly not heard anywhere else. Ron, the history compares to none. Uh, Mitch, uh, you and Vinny just are quite a dynamic <laughs> duo. We will have to get you guys on again. But but for the audience, they've, they've thrown in their excellent discussions, what Jim says. Uh, Toby says, well, finally, an, a Ron F-bomb. Uh, <laughs> Steve says, well done. Uh Cat gives a Sorry smiley about that. face. I, I, I tried not to swear this time. But... <laughs> you did, and you did good. <laughs> Steve says, love it, do it again. Henry says, thank you, guys. Uh, uh, Chris says, you're off the hook, Mike, somehow. I'm, you, maybe that's an insider joke. <laughs> Best yet. Uh, I love that comment from George Mason. So... Listen, guys, this was fantastic. This was, if in case you haven't looked, this is probably 40% higher than any other event that Gourmet Brewing has ever done. So, wow, uh, that's fantastic. So I'm not going to belabor this. I do thank you a lot for this. I thank everybody in the audience that hung in there, all 1,314 of you guys. Uh, Mike, thank you for making this possible uh, and Thanks, the delicious Mike. beers. Uh, Ron, thank you for all the wonderful history. Uh, Mitch, thank you for getting you and Vinny together for such fantastic discussions. And again, thank you for the audience uh, that, that you guys were all willing to sit down and listen to us. Uh, uh, well, I'll say I babbled a bit, but uh, hear this excellent discussion. So, for everybody, have a great end of your weekend. The work week starts in the morning. So thank you. Have a fun rest of the summer and look for us for, I guess, what will probably be a Cascale event coming up in just a few weeks. Bye-bye. <laughs>